Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say that living in Australia forces you to be face to face with some of the best and worst that the environment can offer. And so when you think about the existential crisis of climate change, it becomes very visceral very quickly. And it can be an incredibly challenging thing to talk about, which is why we're so excited to have panel number one talking about gender responsive climate action, because we do know that women are disproportionately going to be impacted by climate disaster. And I'm, I have the absolute honour of introducing our panel, but specifically introducing our moderator. So today's moderator will be Victoria Mackenzie McKay, the environment of the Env Women's Environmental Leaders Australia. Victoria is CEO of Women's Environmental Leadership Australia and has worked in climate and environment leadership for the past 17 years. Wella is an independent, not-for-profit organisation that is empowering, supporting and funding diverse women's leadership in our environment and climate in order to transform Australia's response to these crises. Hi everyone, thank you so much for that introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here today and um, to be a part of this event with ERA. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to Elders past and present um, and to acknowledge this land was never ceded. And I acknowledge the many, many hundreds of generations of matriarchal leadership that has cared for this country, that has cared for this river system, that is just down the road for these floodplains and that has created the space that we are living and thriving on here today. So I acknowledge, I acknowledge them and what they have done. But I also want to acknowledge um, the many, many generations of women who have come before us here in this space, in the women's movement, as well as in the environment space, um, because it is their shoulders that we stand on and that has created the space for us to be having a conversation here today. So I just want to acknowledge so much change has happened, so much space has been created to make this conversation possible and uh, thank and honour them for that. Um, as I was introduced, I have been around climate and environmental policy change-making activism for the last 17 or 18 years. Uh, and it's been quite a ride in Australia. <laughs> Anyone who's been following the debate has seen some pretty, some, some great highs um, and some pretty big lows. Um, but today I want to give you a bit of an introduction to who we are and what we do at Wella and why we are interested in this policy space and how that interacts here. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of that and of, of our recent report and what we've been doing before I introduce our panel and we, we move into a bit of a conversation. Um, as I said, I've been around climate and in, in environmental spaces for a while and I guess um, I grew up in Albury on the banks of the, the Murray River and had always had um, the environment in my lifeblood. That river system is rivers are my lifeblood and absolutely where I connect um, to country. And I fell into this work by chance. It was a very lucky accident. It also meant I fell into the ways of doing this work and the ways of seeing and understanding environmental policy making and environmental change and environmental activism. And so I wasn't necessarily bringing the critical lens of feminism and of gender perspectives to that work because it wasn't in the mix. It wasn't happening around me and you get shaped by the environment that, that you are a part of. And it was only many, many years later where I, when I first intersected with Wella that this lens became much more to life for me. Wella was started in 2016 by a group of women who are the matriarchs of the modern environmental movement in Australia. These women ran the campaign to save the Franklin. They were the founders of the Wilderness Society in Australia. They are the founders of Bush Heritage. They are the founders of the Greens in Australia. They are the founders of the Greens internationally. And you don't know their names because they're women. And they were looking around the environment and the climate movement and seeing the same gender equality issues playing out for modern generations of women that have been their whole lives. Women are the backbone of the environment and climate movement in Australia. They are the majority of staff. They are the majority of volunteers. And yet they were not the majority of CEOs. They were not getting the majority of funding. They were not driving the majority of policy making or strategic decisions or outcomes. And they were fed up. 
So they decided to do something about it and they created an annual leadership development pr program for women and gender diverse people working in the sector to try and address that challenge. At the time, I was the National Climate Campaign Manager for the Australian Conservation Foundation and I was lucky enough to go through that program in its first year. And I found it really quite transformative for me in understanding that I could lead differently. I could do things differently. The reason I didn't feel I was fitting or getting the traction I wanted or feeling like the strategies I was driving were wrong it was not because they were wrong, they just didn't fit the expectations that were put around me. I wanted to do it differently and that, that was okay. It was a revelatory moment for me. They continued running that program on the smell of an oily rag um, as, as full volunteers as they have done their whole careers. Um, and after three years, they were tired. And after three years, I'd also had a little bit of an exploration off in the progressive private sector, seeing exactly the same issues playing out in that space for people working on climate and environment and for women in middle management wanting to do things differently, wanting to lead, wanting to ask questions differently. And they were not all that different to my friends in the not-for-profit environment space. They wore better clothes and they uh, had slightly different language, but we were talking about exactly the same issues. So I came back to Wella and said, hey, I think this program and training 20 women a year, this is amazing, but 20 women a year is not enough. Because the challenge that we face, this is not just about gender equality in environment and climate spaces, this is about strategic impact and whether or not we're actually going to be capable of winning and achieving the systemic change we need on these major crises. Because all of the evidence shows us overwhelmingly that when you have women at the decision making table, you get better environmental outcomes. Now, I know that's not going to be a surprise to this room, and there's plenty of you sitting there thinking, well, that's on everything. <laughs> it's not unique to environment and climate. But it's not discussed in environment and climate issues, and yet these are some of the biggest, most systemic challenges that we are facing as a society, and the gender lens absolutely matters. We see different outcomes when you have more women on boards. We see different outcomes when you have more women elected. We have different outcomes when women are CEOs or in senior management. It transforms the, your emissions portfolio, your water impacts, your sustainability, and yet we are not talking about it and driving it. So if we want to see that happen, we need to be supporting women and gender diverse people from all backgrounds, all sectors, into leadership for the systemic change we want to get. So Wella has been on that path of expanding that work for the last four years. We got some startup funding, I quit my job, like, we're away. I send one email to the climate movement saying, hey, we're doing the thing, and that was our launch. It was pretty minor. But two weeks later, I get a phone call from the women's movement, and it was Helen. <laughs> and she said, um, hi, we've just heard you exist. Um, we're very excited. You're going to be the voice of the environment in the women's movement. And I said, oh, um, Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I actually think we're about building the voice of women in the environment and climate movement, and that's a little bit different. She's like, great, do that too. But you're really needed over here because there's a huge gap. We need to be building environment and climate narratives and understanding and a gender lens into this work in a much bigger way. And I said, look, I'm sure people are doing that though. She's like, oh, it's not happening at the scale needed. And I was like, oh, look, I've been around climate and environmental policy making for quite a while now. I would have noticed. I hadn't noticed. We hadn't noticed. Because there was a gender discussion happening. And that was enough to kind of tick the box. It's happening, it's happening. But it was happening through an international lens only. ActionAid, Oxfam, International Women's Development Agency. Australia has been very progressive at putting a gender lens over climate action through DFAT and in all of our internationally funded work. So we do treat it seriously as long as it happens somewhere else. But you hit the shoreline, it disappears. I had never in my 15 years of, of policy and advocacy work had a serious conversation about how gender genuinely impacted in climate and environmental policy. And it was deeply shocking. And so we've reflected on that at Wella and realised we do have a role and an important role to do something about it. 
So we have been spending the last couple of years meeting with some of you and many other advocates and researchers across the space. And earlier this year, we launched a report, um, Gender, Climate and Environmental Justice in Australia. There is some summary, printed summary copies at the back of the room, but you can also download the full report online to investigate and really understand and start to lay a baseline of understanding of how are these issues playing out in Australia. And there's a couple, I won't run you through the full details, it's fascinating and great reading and I highly encourage you to download and read the full thing. But there's a couple of key lessons. And the first two big ones that I, I want to touch on are, the, are really at a high level. This plays out in terms of climate and environmental impacts and it also plays out in terms of climate and environmental solutions. And that might seem really obvious, but both sides of that, that discussion go missing. We are much more comfortable talking about impacts. Now, we don't talk about it enough, and there is a huge gap in the research, the policy, the understanding, so it is huge and important work to do. But it is the space there has been some steps forward. For example, we know, and we don't yet have the hard data on some of this, but we know it will be older women and single mums who will never be rehoused in the Northern Rivers after those floods. But we know that, what that looks like. We do know from some really good research that the impacts of domestic violence increase significantly after climate and environmental disaster. And we also know those disasters are increasing at a really significant rate. And while it's wonderful to have a whole suite of new gender-related policy strategies and packages coming forward, those strategies and packages do not mention climate and environmental impacts. So our national strategies around addressing domestic violence do not consider the fact that these big drivers of, of crises are going to impact and increase um, violence in our communities and it's not yet part of our strategy. The impacts of climate change and how they affect women and girls and gender diverse people are incredibly important. We need to understand it, we need to work on it, we need to be thinking about it and driving policy into that space. But women and girls and gender diverse people also bring really unique and important perspectives into the solutions framework. And there's a couple of ways that we need to be thinking about that. First, at a, just a very practical level, the clean energy revolution that we are talking about as a nation is not possible with our current workforce limitations. If we want to see the level of change that is needed, one of the biggest impacts that the clean energy sector is facing is pure workforce numbers and skill shortages. If you want to address that, you are going to need to be supporting women into that rapidly growing and comparatively well-paid sector. It's incredibly important. And yet when it comes to trades, like electrical trades, one of the most important skill sets we're going to be needing in this transition, the dial has not shifted. Still only 3% of electricians are women just 3%. And when it comes, when you move up through leadership at the, other end of the, at the other end of the scale, when you're looking at clean energy companies, 19% of clean energy company board members are women. So we've got really big work to do right across the spectrum in really practical ways to think of what is the transformation that's happening? Where do women fit into this? What is the workforce of the future? And how can we be driving that? But women and gender diverse people also bring very different perspectives to what the solution should actually be. And when we put women at the table, the conversation changes quite significantly. But if you picked up the paper tomorrow, you wouldn't know that. Because if you pick up the paper and read about climate change tomorrow, I'm going to lay you London to a brick that you are going to read about uh, energy, transport, mining, finance, politics, bastions of masculine power and control. And the solutions are entirely framed through those same lenses and those same structures and everything that we are talking about is a fix with the same people in control and the same decision-making structures modelling the future unless we think about this differently. But if we actually ask women what solutions they're driving, we do see different things. We see nature embedded much more so. We see process and people as opposed to technology and infrastructure. The ways that there's a fascinating uh, research report that's been done just by, out of Melbourne University, looking at what happens when you ask women engineers to address the water crisis 
as opposed to the vast majority of water engineers who, who are men. And you do see much more focus on relationships and discussion to get your outcome as opposed to technology and infrastructure investment. So we can have a very different pathway forward if we're actually engaging in thinking about not just addressing uh, the workforce challenge, but the entire solutions framework. So how are we going to think about the role of women and gender diverse people as, as it relates to the impacts, as well as the solutions for climate and our environment? But if we then look overarchingly at the whole of the policy suite, which we have not developed yet, and so it's, please don't think you're going to get that answer in the report, you will see a few suggestions, but this is a world of work that we are looking forward to working with you all on in the coming years. But it all points in one direction. If you're actually going to get the level of systems change that we're talking about to achieve the outcomes we need to for a sustainable future in which all of us can thrive alongside nature, then you have to put caring for people and caring for country right at the centre of our decision-making frameworks. We have to think about how we flip and, and reconceive of decision-making and policy-making in Australia. And when I say that, again, there's going to be many of you thinking the entire feminist policy agenda has care right at its centre. This is not new. Well, it is new in many other spaces. It is new in climate and environmental policy making. And the way that we bring these discussions together will be essential for shaping the way that we deal with this enormous crisis in Australia and globally. That is our work and the perspective that we, we're bringing to it. This is a start of a conversation. As I said, we have just launched this, this recent report uh, and we will be continuing these conversations and we look forward to having them with you. But that work has been, in, been, been informed by many others who've been a part of it. Some in the room here today who are not on the panel, as well as our panellists here, who have had input into helping shape that. And I'd love to um, introduce them to you and we'll, we'll start a bit of a discussion. Uh, so today I am joined um, by, first up we have Bianca McNear. Bianca is a proud Malgana woman from Shark Bay in WA uh, and is the coordinator of the Boyungura Nai Nayalu Turtle Monitoring, Turtle Monitoring Program. And I've just learnt that Boyunga is turtle and Nayalu is women. And this is a project that, um, that Bianca has been a leader on and has been quite um, transformative in driving over, over the last few years. We are also joined by um, Mary Pickard. Mary has worked internationally in disaster risk reduction and climate change law and policy since 2006 with a range of internationally focused organisations uh, and has recently supported the development of the Global Gender Action Plan to support implementation of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Management. Uh, Mary's also very active within the, climate, the Women's Climate Congress, who are a fantastic ally and organisation we're very proud to be working alongside. And uh, Claire Gillini. Claire is a policy officer at Women, for Dis with Women and Disabilities Australia. An advocate with lived experience of disability, Claire is also the co-chair of the Oversight Council for the Australian National Autism Strategy. And very interestingly for our discussion today, Claire also volunteers with the WA Department of Fire and Emergency Services and with Disaster Relief Australia. So please welcome them to the discussion. For the discussion today, I'm going to start by asking each of our panellists if you could just take about five minutes each to give us a bit of an introduction to your work, where you're from, and why your work, your passion, your interests or your communities intersects with, with this challenge of gender and climate and environmental justice. Bianca. All right. Um, thanks. Thanks, Victoria. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as well and thank them for... Um, allowing me to be on this country and Uncle Perry for his welcome to country. He's probably long gone by now, run away from all us women's, but <laughs> it's worth a mention. Um, so I'm Mulgana woman from Shark Bay, or we call Kathaguru. Um, I was raised by a very strong woman, very strong mother. Um, she taught me a lot about community connection, um, caring for each other, being respectful, um, and all of the things that um, I, I teach my daughters today. Um, so, and she was also raised by a very, very strong uh, matriarch in our family. So um, the Mulgana community is very strong in their matriarchal leadership. 
Um, having said that, there are always challenges. Um, you know, our culture has been deliberately colonised and in that process there were deliberate attempts to break down our kinship systems, break down our connections to each other. Um, you know, the, treat, the mistreatment of our men in front of our women and vice versa um, were deliberate acts of genocide for our people. And we still live with the effects of that today. So um, it's really important for us as women to stand up and continually push forward the importance of our role in the community. Um, to put it really bluntly, um, uh, in, our, in my community, women are responsible for life and the men are responsible for death. And both are very important cycles and one you can't have without the other. Um, so in my community, we had to fight to be able to go to the nesting sites for the turtles because we'd been disconnected for so long from caring for our country because of colonisation. Um, you know, we've had to hide our children. That was our priority for a very, very long time through the stolen generations. Um, and, you know, hiding our culture as well. Um, you know, we could be arrested um, if we spoke our language and therefore lose our children immediately as well. Um, there were a lot of things put on our Aboriginal women. Um, when we look back, the resilience and the strength of those women that have come before us, it, it just astounds me. Uh, it still never ceases to surprise me. Um, that quiet, strong strength, that vulnerability that actually provides that strength um, and the inclusion that it takes to have that strength. Um, the way that you have to be um, conscious of other people, conscious of everything around you. Um, we don't look at just the problem, we look at everything around that as well. Um, making sure our young boys are included um, and they're able to follow their cultural um, protocols and practices as well is a really important part of our process, our responsibility um, as Nyalus. Um, and so um, I think for us it's, um, you know, with the turtle monitoring program um, in my country, when a turtle is harvested, when it's killed for eating purposes, there's very strong protocol around how that's done. And one of the protocols is that women are not allowed to be around. Um, our fertility is connected to those turtles. So for us, we need to be away. But we were able to reclaim that right to interact with those birthing sites um, through the turtle monitoring program. So once a year, um, we gather a group of Mulgana women and we go to Durkardog Island, or we call Wurrawana, and we get to monitor the big loggerhead turtles there. And those big girls are like our people. Um, they're like our ancestors, our nanas, our grandmothers. Um, those little turtles are, you know, we see ourselves like the little eggs that are left on the shore. Um, you know, and, and our grandmothers and um, aunties and nanas and mothers have all passed on into that and they take off into that ocean, into that world beyond when they pass on. Um, so we're the little turtles left on the beach, you know, to, assist, to raise, raise up, find our way back to the ocean and find our way through the world in the ocean the way they did. They did. Um, and we still have that connection no matter where they are. Um, we were told in my community that we were excluding men from the program, from my uncle, and I said, uncle, really? <laughs> and he said, and then my nana abruptly um, cut in and she said, you followers, you men have had this program and that program, they've done dugong monitoring, one of the leaders in the, in the world for dugong um, tagging and monitoring, um, and along with every other thing like a traditional commercial fishing licences are passed through the men in our family. But it was important for us women to have something. Um, so he got ripped into, he didn't say anything ever again. <laughs> but I did explain to him that men are not excluded from our trip. We have a very important role for men in our trip. We need someone to set up camp and cook and clean for us every day. <laughs> Um, so that is their role. Um, so we make sure that we always have a nephew that comes with us. They have to be younger than us because it's woman's business. Um, so we take a nephew with us. Um, they come over on the trip with us and that's very important um, because it's a very spiritual place, we're at Awana, where we do the log, uh, log ahead monitoring. So um, we have that male component to um, guide us over there. 
um, even though they're very much listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're good boys too. So when we get over there, they make sure we've got everything we need. And I think explaining that process, being making sure we, we come forward together, that's what us, us um, Mulgan and Nyalis do, and, uh, and us as all Nyalis do. Um, we bring everyone forward with it, together with us. We carry the eggs of our generations. We carry the knowledge of our culture as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Bianca. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I was going to be a bit more formal, but actually, I think this will probably work better because I think we need to know who each other is, don't we? Um, so I grew up um, in southwest Victoria, in Portland, um, in a family of eight girls, and my mother became a feminist in the 1970s. So I can never remember not being a feminist. And that's just really been a really important driving force for my whole life. Um, and I worked as a lawyer in Melbourne in the 1990s in labour law and focusing on discrimination law. And then um, we moved internationally in 2000. Um, my partner had a job with the UN and I was the following spouse. And so I had to create a new... Uh, a new image, a new um, set of skills for myself because I couldn't be an Australian lawyer in Geneva. Um, and so I began um, international law um, postgraduate studies at that point. And I, was, I kept hoping that I would be able to get a job in the UN, but this never materialised. Um, so I kept applying and eventually gave up. Um, th then we were in Guatemala and um, there was a massive tropical storm which had devastating effects throughout the country. It was basically incredibly heavy rain for weeks and weeks. And some of the damage that was done there, which I didn't personally see, but it still had a very big impact on me because I had been there, um, was the whole side of a mountain slipped down and covered a village um, with um, and killed approximately a thousand people. And when I looked into that, I realized that there was things that could have been done to prevent that. Um, and I was actually engaged by the International Federation of the Red Cross at that point to do um, a, a review of how international assistance worked in relation to the response to that disaster. So there was a lot of similar but smaller incidents around the country at that time. And so I had to look at what, what was coming in and, and, and how it was tailored to what was actually needed and who they asked and so on. Um, and at that stage, I have to say, I didn't find a way to apply a gender lens um, at all to that. I was, it was a new world to me. Um, and, um, and I have to say, I continued to work in this area for quite a few years before I really found a way to bring that in. And it's really only in the last... So I worked in that since 2006, um, moved back to Geneva and then later to Zimbabwe. Um, so in that process, I developed my sort of um, own... Um, focus in this area and um, really started combining, first of all, disaster risk reduction, a focus on risk reduction um, more than response and um, the, the law and policy frameworks because that was my background um, and really only probably in the last decade have managed to bring that together um, with uh, gender equality and, um, and, and then spread more widely also into the whole climate change area. Um, so I think this is still when I first started researching in this area six, seven years ago, well, 2016, it's a bit longer than that, um, uh, its first big project on gender and disaster risk reduction, there was almost no literature on it. There was almost no research on it. And so I was really scratching around trying to find uh, a whole lot of different data from different areas. And there's still not good international data. Um, and um, there's, But there's a lot of really good uh, context-specific research. And so that's what we tend to rely on. Um, so in the work I've been doing in the last 18 months with the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, what we were trying to do with that was to coalesce a whole lot of knowledge and understanding by, through a lot of consultations about what were the key things that we could really tackle in relation to gender equality and disaster risk reduction in the next six years. So, um, because this is all based around the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which is the global framework 
um, that uh, it's a it's a voluntary agreement, but it, it's countries sign up to it and take it very seriously. Um, because that agreement itself was developed, um, agreed in 2015, and it was had some stuff about women in it, but basically it's a pretty gender blind um, system, and it certainly doesn't have any kind of system analysis about the sources of um, gender inequality and the sources of different outcomes in disasters. Um, so this uh, send off. Um, gender action plan was really intended to address uh, many of the gaps in that and to give uh, the willing countries and governments and civil society organisations that support them um, some some clear sets of priorities on where how we can really make a difference in integrating gender equality into disaster risk reduction. So then that brings me to where does climate change come into this and What's happened really is that there's been a huge convergence of um, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction as, as the impacts of global warming are taking effect and we see an increased uh, severity and increased um, diversity of climate related disasters as we've all seen in Australia with floods and fires increasing in intensity and frequency as well as different um, differences in tropical storm activity. So. We're now seeing it. It took a long time to really be able to see it in a physical sense. Um, and unfortunately for a lot of people, seeing is believing, but we've got there now, I think. <laughs> um, so I um, have, oh, in, the gender, in the Gender Action Plan, we've really been looking at ways of addressing um, the different um, impacts, um, the gender related impacts, by looking at what their sources are, using gender analysis to understand that it's not just something about women that that disasters happen to hit women or people of diverse genders worse. It's to do with the inequality structures in society. And so we need to look at what the actual sources of that risk are and address that through gender analysis and through much greater engagement and leadership of women. So the Weller report is really talking about doing all this stuff in Australia um, in a way that I, it's really helpful. I'm really glad that you've done that report um, because I've been um, I've been back in Australia for seven years, but I've still been working mainly internationally, and um, and been trying to apply that to Australia, and really uh, I, that experience of like it, it stops at the border is really interesting because we had a lot of engagement from the Australian government in um, the development of the Gender Action Plan, um, but it was mainly about what Australia does in its uh, development role in other countries. And so now part of my mission personally is to um, get that better known within government and actually say this is something that Australia should be doing because we still have very low representation of, of women and diverse people of diverse genders in our emergency response services. And we also still have, I think, much too great an emphasis on emergency response and not enough on prevention and risk reduction. When we look at the way our cities are developing and the decisions that are being made now that are creating risks for the future. Um, and I've also seen that in the current policy development processes within federal government, which it's great to see happening, I must say, on uh, climate change adaptation, for example, so far, I haven't seen evidence of a gender lens being applied. Um, so it's it's the same thing that I've seen internationally in both disaster risk reduction and climate change policy and and planning that it's regarded as a, like somehow a technical field that's somehow divorced from people. Um, and and that idea is has got gender blindness built into it because if you don't look at who who things are affecting and who should be involved, uh, and you say it's a technical issue, uh, then you can just look at things like hazards and temperatures and, and floods and, and it's like all these nice measurable things in the very traditional masculine approach to science um, and it's not about, okay, well, who is this affecting and how is it affecting and why is it affecting people differently? So that's really great that Weller has integrated this work um, into the Australian context. So that's all I'll say for now. I've probably gone on too long already. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, and yes, welcome to the conversation, Claire. You talk about being intimidated. Did you want to be me right now? <laughs> Far out. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I just want to um, 
uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on today and also um, where I live in Borloo or Perth. Um, it's lovely to be cold, but it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just also going to acknowledge uh, I am autistic and I'm a sensory seeker and I do not like shoes. So I am sitting here with no shoes on and I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but if I wear shoes, I can't concentrate on the conversation, especially when I'm up uh, on a place like this. Um, I'm pretty new to this space. Um, it's really uh, only been since 2022 that I um, have been actively involved um, in, in disaster preparedness, response and prevention, um, and particularly with a women's, uh, with a gendered lens as well. Um, I grew up military, so my dad was in the Air Force, so I was at like my 14th school by year nine and things like that, so I've had a pretty diverse and fairly rubbish educational outcome, um, <laughs> being autistic as well. Um, but I got to see a lot of really great things and um, my family was uh, a real bunch of nature lovers, so we spent a lot of time camping and so I have a, um, a very deep appreciation for the natural world um, and uh, seek that out whenever I can. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I actually came to the to the disaster space quite by accident. Um, in 2022, I found myself at the United Nations in New York. Still not quite sure how that happened, um, and spent the first couple of days waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder and take my pass off me when they worked out I wasn't supposed to be there. But on the very first day, we got lost, and we ended up in uh, a side event uh, that was all about. The Ukraine and what was happening there. It was four months in to the conflict there and uh, I think the day or two days before Pakistan had gone underwater. So there was a lot happening in this space. And again, you know, we got lost and we found ourselves in this room listening to this very high level conversation about what was happening. Um, and the conference that I was at was focused on people with disability. So we were hearing some pretty awful stories that I won't recount here but about how people with disability were being treated, uh, mistreated, abused, uh, placed in the firing line, um, and it was a pretty harrowing conversation. But at one point, the conversation turned and the, the speakers started talking about how we were actually part of the effort and, and part of the resistance and part of the you know, recovery in some areas. Uh, the, the speaker started talking about how people with disability and women with disability who'd been left behind were taking shelter in hospitals and started to help work and volunteer in the hospitals and do things like prepare food and sterilise equipment and sit with patients and do some of the nursing duties. She talked about how people with disability were loading up their... Uh, modified vehicles and driving uh, supplies out to the troops. And I thought to myself, if they can do that, there's got to be something that I can do. And I'll never forget that conversation because as that conversation was happening, she was on the phone and you could hear the bombs in the background. I still get emotional. <laughs> but it changed my life. It, uh, that... that that one half hour moment in time has completely turned on its head the direction of the work that I do. And me being me, I like to always take things to extra. So the first thing I did when I come home was volunteer for, for DFES, for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, because I looked around and I thought, we're not part of the conversation here in Australia. Let alone being a woman, but being a woman with disability, we're not part of the conversation. My dad is a long-term volunteer in the, in, the, in the emergency services. He's gone from the SES to the ambulance to now fire. And the first thing he said to me was when I joined up was don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone you've got a disability because you won't be accepted. Well, one bit of a LinkedIn search will tell you it's a little bit late for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I wanted to understand why. Um, as an advocate, sometimes in you know, other things that I've worked in, we've spent a lot of time on the outside trying to get systems to change. And I think one of the things that certainly in our, in our sector, we, we do ourselves a disservice because we don't understand the way those, sec those things work from the inside. 
uh, and I wanted to know how those things work from the inside. And I actually found that I really loved it. It challenges me, it breaks my heart. Um, I see some really awful things, but I also see some greatness and I do see sometimes, sometimes you have to smack the men around a little bit, but sometimes you do see a willingness to, to be more inclusive and to change. Um, and it's now become a huge part of what I do. Um, I'm, I do a little bit of work with the University of Sydney uh, on um, person-centred emergency preparedness, getting people with disability um, prepared. Um, I have a very strong focus myself on getting women with disability prepared because often um, the women, even though they have disabilities, are, are the caregivers in the home. Uh, and we know that even though, like, the, the, the general statistics um, around people with disability in disasters and, and emergencies and humanitarian situations is we're two to four times more likely to die or be injured. We're the first to be left behind, we're the last to be rescued. And we actually suffer the effects of those uh, um, events much, much longer than people without. So I spend a lot of time trying to get my community ready. And it's a bit of a hard slog in WA because we haven't really faced a lot of what you guys have faced here in the Eastern States, but we are getting there. Um, uh, yeah, and then, and then I stumbled across um, Disaster Relief Australia. There's a blokey institution. Um, but we'll get there. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I just really enjoy being part of that recovery process as well. Um, and also for me personally, uh, being involved with both of those organisations um, as an advocate, sometimes it can take years to affect change. And this is a way for me to have an immediate impact in my community, so I really do value that. Um, but yeah, I won't keep talking about it too long because I, mean, I know you've got questions that I don't want to answer before you've asked them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I feel a, a bit of a responsibility within um, my community that um, especially for women with disability, where we're sort of doubly marginalised, I guess, um, even at a lot of the tables around gender, we're not there. Um, I went to one the other day in Perth, and I won't name it, but I sort of sort of put my hand up and said, you know, I'm a woman with disability, and the first thing the speaker did was look under the table from my wheelchair. Yep. <laughs> It comes in many forms. We're very diverse. Uh, so, you know, I think that there's still... Um, it's less of a divide when we're talking to the men folk, but we still have a big divide, and I think that I'm really um, thankful to be here that hopefully we can have some of that conversation today. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, and you're right, I do have a few questions. However, I also know that your st all of your stories are incredibly powerful in the pathways that you've taken to this and you've all each found your own pathway into a very big, complex, intersectional space. So rather than just keep hearing from us, I'm actually going to hand it over to you all for a few minutes and give you as an audience some time to talk to each other in twos or threes about what has really stood out to you from what you've heard thus far, but also to reflect on with each other, where does this intersect into your work and into your world? What what are the spaces that you can see already this work connecting? Um, because it is only work we're going to be all taking forward together. So it's over to you to have those conversations for the next five minutes or so. To those of you online, I think you're able to talk to each other in the chat. And so do feel free to um, drop in that reflection on how this connects to your work into the chat. Otherwise, we'll see you back in, in a few minutes time. Thanks. Over to you all.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start here because that is a question I want to bring up. So I'm going to actually go the reverse order for the next. Let me come back and I'll start with that. Well, well, maybe once Claire's answered, you should just, just jump in on the question as well and add into it. That would be great. Was there anything additional you wanted to pull in here too? I mean, I've got, I've got one or two thoughts I want to, but it'll keep me at pretty high level. So if you if it's somewhere you want to go that's more direct, let me know.
and just one or two more minutes and then I'll call you back. I feel like you may have just solved this crisis with the level of in-depth conversation and, and discussion happening here. <laughs> if I'd been more prepared, I'd have bought butcher's paper and um, forced you all to be writing our strategic plan for the next little while. Can I ask, for those of you who are just returning and coming back into the conversation, can I ask if, um, hands up, if this is a conversation you're happening, having in your workplace or in your sector regularly? Regularly. Okay, all right, there's like 10 to 15 people. That's not bad. Hands up if this is part of your workload. You see this is actually part of your role. Slightly different group of people, which is interesting. <laughs> Hands up if this is the first time you've had a really in-depth conversation about how this in issue interacts to your work. Yeah, similar, similar, similar mix. So we've got quite a spectrum of experience and, and level of engagement in this in the room, uh, which is great. It means we're not at the starting point. We're starting to see these conversations emerging, but there's lots more for us to do to be connecting with each other around that. Um, Thank you, and I hope that that was useful in terms of just being able to see and hear from different perspectives in this space. I want to bring us back to our panellists. We are um, only just touching the surface of their experience. But, um, Claire, I want to come back to you, if I can. You, you spoke about um, vulnerability and the risk that... Um, the experience of, of people with disabilities in this space is only considered as one of vulnerability. I guess that ties closely to the concerns that I have looking across this, that the experience of, of women more broadly is also only considered as one of vulnerability. Um, and as an example of that, we, we've just re released this report. Um, we've managed to get a little bit of media traction around it, which is great. It's what you know, we all want to do when we write and launch our reports. Um, hard media journalists were really only interested in stories of increased domestic violence against women. The rest of the angles, mm -hmm, yep, but not really newsy. The, the narrative and the framing of women as vulnerable, um, there's abs it's very important, this work is important and it's core, but it's also, it's a risk that it becomes a box as well. How, how are you seeing this play out and where do you think the opportunities are to broaden that conversation? Yeah, there's nothing better for clickbait than a story about a poor disabled person, hey? <sighs> um, it's very much the same for us. Um, it's very hard to get traction on, on good news stories. It's very hard to get uh, engagement um, in conversations around our capabilities and our capacity. Last year I was at um, the National Preparedness Summit. Um, it was a very interesting space. It was full of men in uniform and me in the loudest clothes ever. Um, these earrings, I dress like this the rest of me, the rest of the time. <laughs> this is behaving today. Um, so it was a really space where I stood out like a sore thumb. And it was a perfect example uh, to me of what we need to change. There was two panels on disability and not one disabled person spoke at it. Yeah, those are not the words I use, but yeah. <laughs> and, you know, one was a service provider and one was uh, an academic talking about us and our vulnerability. And at the end of the day, I cracked it, right? Absolutely cracked it. I had the last opportunity to speak and I, and I stood up and I said, listen, I want to change this narrative. I want to invite you all 
to start seeing us as something other than the bloody problem to be solved, right? Yes, there are things about our lives that make us more at risk, but nothing makes us more at risk than not being at the table when you lot are developing solutions and policy and ideas and preparing and all of those things. Like we're, we're not there, we're not thought about. And that type of exclusion from systems and policies, I believe, and I think from our conversation our panellists would agree, actually places us, or actually impacts our vulnerability more than uh, our various disabilities or our various experiences. And I see that played out every day when I do preparedness work with the, our community because when people with significant support needs have support to understand the risk that they face and be prepared and supported to activate when they need to, then the outcomes for them are much better than when we're not. But I keep looking around and I keep seeing us not at these tables. And I keep seeing solutions then being built for communities that exclude us. Um, you know, as a, sorry if there's anyone from NEMA here, but they, they um, introduced a funding program in the Northern Rivers to lift all the houses. Yeah. You try and get the NDIS to fund a wheelchair that will go up some stairs. So then where there's a whole bunch of people with mobility issues then excluded from the housing market in what's already a very tight housing market. Whereas if there'd been greater diversity at the table when those sorts of solutions are being built on a, and a, you know, and looking at responses on a community level, I don't think that would have passed. Somebody would have put their hand up and said, wait a minute. And so, yeah, I, I keep coming back to that. Yes, we, we face more risks, you know, it's, it's true. But there's no greater risk than being excluded from those conversations, I believe. I'll stop there because I could get on this soapbox for days. <laughs> Mary, did you want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, I think the, the conversation about vulnerability is a, kind of a dangerous one, isn't it? Um, I, in preparation for the, um, the gender action plan, the background work for that, we, we prepared a, a report and I actually called that beyond vulnerability um, because really the, the whole framing of um, gendered differences in, in disasters had been around the idea that somehow women who were usually then added on to children um, were inherently vulnerable as a group. And, and the conversation about disability um, in disaster risk reduction is always about vulnerability as well. So actually we pride ourselves on the fact that we managed to write this um, intersectional gender action plan without using the word vulnerability in the entire document. <laughs> so um, a lot of people tried to get us to, but we managed not to. There's different ways of talking about the issue and certainly as you were using, um, Claire, risk, using the term risk, um, gives you much more of the social context of, of how risk is created because risk isn't just about the hazard, risk is about the social context um, where the hazard hits and then what policies you put in place and what actions you take in response to, to that hazard. So um, that's where the whole idea of risk reduction comes in. And so if someone's inherently vulnerable, then they're, they're just a goner from day one. You can't do anything about it, can you? And the idea of asking them um, is, is then sort of goes out the door as well because vulnerable people are just vulnerable. Um, and so why would you ask them what you can do about it? So I think that's a really important point and um, it's something that we need to, to include much more in a high level of our awareness when we're talking about these issues. Can I just add one more thing that I just remembered? Um, one of the things that's really missing from the conversation and that I would really love to bring to the fore, both with a focus for women and women with disability, is just how capable we are. You know, um, we are like caregivers, we are community contributors, we're activists, we are, you know, the, the people that know where the people are. Um, we already live through or exist in systems and policies and whatever you want to call it that is not built for us, so we're already agile and flexible and creative. And those are the very sorts of things that if you look at, you know, strategies and stuff like that, they're looking for people who are agile and flexible and creative, right? We're all doing it as women. We're juggling work. We're juggling home life, whatever. We're, you know, we're very good at it. 
ask the boys in my house to multitask, forget about it. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, as part of the solution, we are already – we're already feeling the impacts of climate change and we're already adapting and we're already building solutions and we're already connected to communities in ways that a lot of the decision makers wish they could be. So that's our – that's our – our, our, our bring to the table kind of thing. I lost my words there, but that's what we bring. We bring those um, ideas about solutions. And what we also bring is an awareness of what's not going to work. So when people start to think, oh, well, we'll just do this, we can go, hang on a minute. That's not going to work for this community because X, Y, Z, because we're connected as women and, and as women with disability as well. So I think that's, um, that's a, a very strong... Um, not gift, but, you know, that's something that we bring to the table that is really vulnerable. And particularly if you think about a time where the, the events are becoming more frequent and more impactful and resources are becoming less, would you not want people like us at the table to tell you where to spend your money better? Mm. We, know how to, we know what's not going to work. We know what's going to be a waste. So talk to us and we can help you actually get more bang for your buck. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Bianca, did you also want to jump in on this on this theme? Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'd mention um, from a first women's First Nations women's perspective as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of colonial vulnerabilities put on us. Um, but what we what we we know as First Nations women is, you know, our job when we come on country and when we work together, we're all the same. There's no difference between us. Although we sit on the sit in these chairs here today, representing different aspects of the community, we all sit on country as the same people, as in, as all one. Um, and you know, with our important role as women is um, to pass on the knowledge of our culture, um, and that that is no vulnerability there. That co passing on of that continuous cult, the oldest continuous culture in the world is a huge strength. It's a strength that's been our foundation of this country for however long, generations, thousands and thousands of generations. Um, and it's something that still is still there today. Um, so I think um, understanding that those those colonial asp um, ideals of what may be vulnerable don't, don't represent us, they don't represent our culture. Um, that strength that I've seen come through my generations, those stories my grandmothers told me, the hiding of our children, um, you know, the, the assumption of domestic violence being part of our culture, you know, all of those things, we, 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 we pass through those. We, we continue to push through, evolve and adapt and make sure we're all moving together. Um, so just wanted to mention that, yes, in that context of vulnerability as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mary, I wanted to come back to how you're viewing and what you've seen of where Australia compares. I spoke before and mentioned that, um, you know, we're seeing that climate environmental policy making isn't being considered in the suite of gender uh, responsive strategies and policies in Australia at the moment. But likewise, and I, I should have said this, uh, gender is completely absent from the climate and environmental policy frameworks at the moment and um, as a clear example of that the the federal ALP government's sort of flagship policy right now is is the um, future made in Australia policy or platform but unless there's a gender loans over this this is going to be a future made in Australia by blokes for blokes the entire package is structured around very masculine dominated industries and investment platforms and structures and com owned companies. Um, it's, it's a deeply concerning future unless we get that lens in. From what you've been seeing internationally, how are you seeing Australia compare to how this might be being developed in other developing or developed countries? Um. You're stretching the extent of my knowledge about individual countries here, but there's a few that um, are doing quite a good job, I mean, and some surprising, um, like in Bangladesh, for example, they're doing much more integrated approaches with gender into their disaster and climate change policy areas, and Canada's also doing very well, um, also in what it supports internationally in terms of projects. Um, it's funny, but actually some of the most developed and rich countries are more separated 
in their approaches and, and, and Australia I think is one of those in that we have this thing called emergency response which exists in isolation um, from everything else and we have this thing called climate change um, which has been until very recently very focused on the mitigation aspects and hasn't got very far on that and really the in-depth conversation on adaptation is really only just beginning I think and there is an opportunity though in Australia to really get in there for the, the feminists, the gender lens to get in there now because at the national level that climate change adaptation policy is under development this year um, and there's still possibilities to intervene in that. But yes, I, it's, a, it's a hard one to tackle and I would say I don't really know of any country that's got it right. Um, and it's certainly one that, um, I mean, internationally really the, the silos still exist. So under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement and so on, there is a gender action plan, um, but that's really quite separate from the Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and its gender action plan. We've tried to integrate a little bit, but um, one of the big connectors um, between those worlds is in fact women's organisations. Um, so the Women Environment and Development Organisation, for example, is one where they're really involved in climate change and um, gender and um, other, e other sort of um, environmental alliances as well as um, in disaster risk reduction. So in many ways, I think women are the connectors um, internationally as well as nationally. And I, that's actually one of the things that the Women's Climate Congress is really interested in doing, is basically mobilising women to have these really positive conversations at community level and with parliamentarians uh, to, to develop a, a, fi a sustainable future. Um, and so that's really about bringing a gender equality lens and women's <coughs> leadership and empowerment to these conversations. And I think groups like this and the Women's Climate Congress um, are really important for cutting across because I think that the government structures are kind of inherently um, a bit inflexible. And so we, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I think that's something that we can do. Thank you, thank you very much. And Bianca, we're nearly at time, so I'll, I'll f leave you with the final question. I guess, uh, look, I'm aware of your long history in land conservation projects and the Turtle Monitoring Project and a few other uh, pieces that you've been involved in historically and currently. But you've also been, and you are also still involved in a CSIRO project um, looking at and bringing to the fore First Nations perspectives in addressing climate and environmental issues. Where are you seeing the big opportunities um, for lifting First Nations women's voices into the discussion? And what, what are the spaces where those voices are missing most? Like how, how, can we, how can we make sure that those voices are being amplified and shaping the discussions that we need to be having? Um, I think uh, the first um, opportunity for me is has been ranger programs. So for traditional owner ranger programs, um, Aboriginal ranger programs, they um, were you know set up mainly pushed through um, with ab full of Aboriginal men. Um, so now we're seeing the women slowly coming forward and saying, you know, we know there's men's business and there's women's business, but where there's men's business, there is also women's business and there's also community business. And it, one doesn't exist without the other. All three exist at the same time. Um, all three have a responsibility to all three of those places, whether it be to, um, to leave space there for other people to have that or, not, or um, to be involved. Um, both are just as important. So... Um, Elevating women rangers is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, working with, you know, um, we've had native title borders put down on us. Um, we can't, we get into some really big community um, conflict throughout those processes. But outside of that, as women, we we're able to work together because we know that we have to raise these girls, we have to raise these women and men, we have to raise our, our next community. And our community isn't happy, our country is, is not happy 
and therefore our community is not. Like they always, like we always say, healthy country, healthy people. Um, and that's very, very prevalent in our communities. Um, our seagrass is dying off in our country. So one of the very important roles that our women um, put forward was actually to reintroduce, reintroduce a language name for our seagrass. So now we call it our Wurdia Jalianu. Um, and also to teach our kids, for us to learn and then to teach our kids how to plant seagrass seedlings, which we've never even um, had to think about um, in the last three generations that I'm aware of. Um, so they're the, they're the things that we really want to bring forward. And I've, I just wanted to say, you know, I've been asked by non-Aboriginal women, you know, how do we take on the care of country like First Nations women do? Um, you know, and I'm, and I always, you know, being non-Aboriginal people, and I always say that we've learnt from country. You know, country is mother nature. Country is our mother. Country teaches us the matriarchal ways. And then in our essence, I believe our Aboriginal culture is matriarchal. It is matriarchal ways. So for me, getting rid of the patriarchy is just the same as coming back to our old Aboriginal beliefs it brings us to the same space. It brings us back to learning from country, caring for country and everything that lives and breathes and even is seen and not seen on our country as well. So to wrap it up, we're gonna bring down the patriarchy, <laughs> deeply connect to country and to one another, centre care and caring for country, caring for people and caring for country at the centre of all of our decision making. And we are going to make sure in this process we are entirely inclusive because the exclusive nature of our work is what creates the vulnerability. All right, I'll take that as my, as my to-do list. Please um, join me in thanking this fabulous panel for their work and their speaking today. I'm sure you'll agree it's a real privilege to have this expertise and knowledge with us. Um, but this is the start of the work, as I mentioned. Um, there is, there's obviously a lot of you already working on this and in this space, and we are really keen to connect more, and our broad community um, is keen to connect with you. We have a lot of work to do here, but I really do genuinely believe that we will not get out of this mess that we are in unless women are taking a very different role in the leadership of the future we are creating. And I look forward to doing that with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much to that brilliant panel. Um, when we were talking in the question time, uh, Tash and I were talking a lot about collective grief and how it can be a really challenging space when talking about climate change to kind of address that kind of grief that is almost insurmountable. But listening to that incredible panel and talking about process and people over technology and infrastructure was incredibly energising and a very optimistic way to continue the day. <laughs>